Hola, muy buenas tardes. Saludos desde Santa Marta. Les habla José Quirós. José, buenas tardes. ¿Cómo estás? Qué envidia el clima de Santa Marta. <risa> Oiga, pero uno <risa> a veces deseando el clima a otras partes, oye. Por estos días ha estado, pues no lloviendo muy fuerte, pero sí cayendo una, unos eh, serenos, como llamamos acá en la costa, llovizna, pues, y ha aplacado bastante el clima, pero, pero en general bien, en general bien. Muy bien pues te invitamos a Bogotá cuando puedas venir para que bajes la temperatura un poco. <ríe> sí, señor. Así será. En cuanto tenga la oportunidad, así será. Créame que sí. <ríe> bueno, estamos esperando cinco minutos más. Eh, ya tenemos eh, 22 personas. Esperamos que a las 5 de la tarde ya estemos todos los que eh, aceptamos la invitación. Eh, hacemos las mismas recomendaciones de siempre. Eh, mantener efectivamente sus micrófonos apagados y en la medida de lo posible pues vamos a, a, a dejar las cámaras también apagadas, esto con el ánimo de facilitar la, la comunicación. Buenas tardes, Jair. Buenas tardes. Y para recordarles a todos que también estamos conectados por, el, por YouTube y también tenemos algunas personas ya ingresando a YouTube, ¿no? solamente Perfecto. los 23 que estamos en el momento sino ya tenemos a algunos otros también ingresando a esta conexión. En Muchas vivo, gracias, en Jairo, por la, por la cuña. Entonces, de una vez aprovecho para informarles que Jairo nos va a estar eh, pasando la información de las personas que están conectadas a YouTube. Entonces, eh, obviamente, al igual que siempre, pueden hacer todas las preguntas que ustedes consideren eh, necesarias por el chat. Y al final de la presentación se las vamos a pasar directamente al presentador. Que el presentador ya está que se presenta. <ríe> Ay, que la parte de las preguntas es, es, la, es la parte donde por alguna razón se cae la red. Sí, sí, sí. Eso está fríamente calculado así. <risa> ok. Um... Oh man, it's almost five.
Shall we? Yeah, I guess. All right. So um, we have uh, 37 people so far hearing um, connected through this uh, via Zoom. And uh, we are also connected via YouTube. Um, here in the chat, we already have the information if you want to share it with, um, with your friends who you may know that would like to connect. So please do share uh, the links so that they could either be on this one or on the other channel. All right, so for today, we're gonna be, um, we are gonna have the, the, the webinar held by um, Dr. Jose Aldemar Alvarez. He has um, various hats. He's gonna be wearing at least three of them today as the member of the ASOCOPY board, as uh, also the uh, full-time professor of of the Universidad del Valle, and also lecturer of various master's programs throughout Colombia. And of course, as a very uh, productive researcher and author of various um, articles and books in regards to, of course, teaching English as a foreign language as well. Uh, today, he's going to talk about uh, multimodalities. So uh, once again, same recommendation, please turn off your microphones, turn off your um, cameras so that the communication could be a lot easier and maybe faster. Thank you very much. And any question, please do not hesitate to type it on the chat. Uh, thank you very much, Jose, for having accepted and having organized these webinars uh, for us. Um, basically, Jose is the, the one who's been pulling all the strings to put together these webinars. So thank you very much on behalf of ASOCOPY and thank you very much on behalf of all the teachers who have um, attended these webinars. Um, well, you know what to do. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Uh, can, can, anybody, can everybody hear me? Absolutely. All right. Okay. Um, so, um, so, all right. So, uh, hi everyone. Um, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, I hope uh, you're all safe and healthy as well as your families. Um, so today I'd like to share um, some of the things that I've been doing. I'm in trying to conceptualize and uh, make operational the concept of multimodal pedagogies. And um, I will try to, uh, I, I will actually, I won't try to dig into theory uh, because we wanted this uh, series of webinars to be more uh, practice oriented. So uh, I will not, uh, dig into theory um, uh, that much, uh, just some basic concepts so we can, you know, uh, uh, be on the same page throughout the presentation. Um, I also wanted to invite you to um, join our uh, special interest group, uh, which is called a uh, Core CMC and Multimodal Pedagogies, as you can see on screen. Uh, I, is everybody? Uh, um, um, watching my screen? I am. All right, great. Um, so, so if you are more interested in what uh, we'll be talking about today, you can, uh, uh, you feel free to go to uh, the um, SIG. You can, uh, you can also uh, be part of the SIG and uh, you will have access to bibliography and also discussions and find out more about what I will be talking about today. So this is um, uh, what, so as you see, um, there's different things I do uh, as being part of ASOCOPY and also part of the um, of Universidad del Valle. Uh, what I would like to go over today is um, this. Um, I would, you know, I would like to provide a little background, then I'd like to um, introduce a couple of concepts and I'd like to uh, show you examples, which is for me the core of the presentation today. And I also want to, um, of course, conclude uh, providing some you know, strategies or some recommendations. So, um, so a little bit of background, and I wanted to start by um, a caveat. And, um, some of the things that I'm gonna be talking about today are 
very familiar to you. Basically, many of you would say, I, I, I do that, you know, like this is what I do in my class, right? So, um, and um, so that's okay, um, because really what I will be doing today is showing you some of the things that many of you already do. Some others would say, I don't have the access to that technology or I don't have, my students don't have access to that technology. Um, so, you know, I don't have any more, my intentions don't go beyond uh, showing you what I do, sharing what I do, and also perhaps throwing, um, wait a minute, I have, I'm having a problem here with my computer, as I see, All right? Uh, and perhaps throwing out another way of looking at things. That's, you know, that's the, the other intention I have, you know, maybe whatever you're doing, maybe there's another way of saying it, right? So, and um, I, I wanna start by um, uh, introducing you to this guy, his um, Nathan, he's my son. He is a seven years old. Um, and so Nathan is in the process of developing his L1 Spanish and the L2 English. And um, and then as a you know, as a, an emerging bilingual L2 speaker, um, now and then I like to pay attention to the things he does and uh, the ways he is appropriating. English. And so what I want to show you is a couple of things that I have had the chance to keep record of. So but before I move on, I wanted just to double check on uh, you guys. How are you guys uh, holding up? All right. Good. I am able to see some of you. And okay, great. So it feels a little lonely when I when I don't see people, <laughs> and that's why it's like I need to double check that I have an audience. Um, so, so I want to show you a couple of things that I've been able to to see uh, that that he does. Um, so this is uh, one um, book he designed. Um, so and here I I looked at the characteristics. So. Uh, the book has is bound, right? It's got a title and it has an author. And I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna uh, oversize here. So it's, it's bound, he used staples, he's got a title and he also, you know, he, he's got, a, he's got a a, 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 um, an author, right? So it seems like he, he has a very clear idea of how the book industry works. And then he has here, um, some of uh, some text. Uh, do you guys recognize this character? If you have kids, uh, you may, or even if, of course, you, uh, yeah, some people are saying, yes, yeah, that's Goku or Dragon Ball series, right? And so he's been watching the series, and of course, as a, as a, as a literacy practice, he's engaging in it in different ways. And this is one way he's engaging with it. Um, so uh, he's got some text here, right? And uh, you can even check that he's got very interesting grammar, you know, I wish for the good guys not to come to, come to life, right? Um, so that's one case. Um, this is another production. This is with painting, yes, on his hands. And it seems he used some other material here. This is him uh, working on a computer and doing a puzzle. This is something else he developed. These are some other things he's done. And this one was interesting because you see what he's doing here. Uh, he stapled some animals and then he used tape for some other animals. And uh, this is the zoo, and for some reason he put the title on top and he stapled it. And um, yeah, so I was interested in that, what the way he uh, just decided to perform that work of little work of art. 
And then there's uh, 3D stuff he does now and then, right? Well, this is to appropriate the idea of um, shapes, right? Geometric shapes. Now, and there's this. Oh, I wanna, I think, can you guys hear that? I'm not sure if I shared the sound of my screen. I may not have done it. No, we cannot listen. All right, I'm gonna have to um, share screen again because I have to make sure that I shared sound. And yeah. Right, there you go. There we are. All right, so you guys tell me if this one you is can, the if, 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 how do you, if you can hear now. Wait a minute. Yes, yes, we can hear. Well, again, explain this, what is that? And how do you do it? Can you hear? Yes, okay. yes. sorry about that. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. What is that? And how do you do it? Ahí es una P, hay una E, y ahí es una Z. Mm, that's pretty cool. Y ahí, ahí es una G, sin con esta rayita, acá es una A, la T está acá. acá. Right. Y la O está acá. And what does it say? Ahí dice gato. Mm. Y acá pez, y acá... What about that one? <laughs> Ahí no hice ninguna letra. No? Ahí se lo dije. Uh, and what, what did you do this one with the with that idea of the of the letters? Mm. Bueno. Just because? <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. I like it. Thank you. And this, what is this? Es una cosa. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Thank you, boy. Okay. Um, listen, I have, you know, I have a lot of people sending me messages right now that they can't connect for some reason. They didn't get the the, the links, and uh, you. It seems like the the um, my cell phone is gonna drive me crazy. Um, how many people are there connected right now? We have 62 people right here. And 32 people on YouTube. Yeah, uh, I have many people telling me, I didn't get the link, I didn't get the link, I didn't get the link. Um, yeah. Um, um, I, um, I don't know if you guys, uh, excuse me for a second, and I send the link to these people. Is that too rude of me? Not, not at all. Actually, I was gonna say if you could have that one as your, um, of your uh, profile picture there in your WhatsApp. Oh, I oh know it, it'll take me forever to try to do that uh, now, but I'm going to send it right now um, yeah, to these people. Yeah. Okay, uh, hopefully they will share it. Okay, so, so, okay, so why, um, why am I sharing all of these um, multimodal and multi literacy practices of my, my son with you? Well, because um, it is related to some of uh, the, to some of the principles of multimodal pedagogies and um, to the oh, argument yeah. that I wanna make uh, today. And um, so these are different um, um, elements of multimodal pedagogies. Uh, I, there are many principles, um, but again, we don't have the time to go over all of them and to uh, you know, do a, a meaningful presentation of them, but at least I'm going to talk, try to tackle on these four. Okay, so one of the first things that I want to um, put forth today is that um, we don't teach language. Uh, what we teach is communication. Yes. So, um, 
when in the, the thing that I always say is that you, when you ask your students what they are learning language for, they're not learning language to be able to use the grammar. They are learning language to communicate. So in multimodal pedagogies, we move from the idea that we're teaching language uh, and we're teaching communication and all of the complexity that it implies in uh, what communication is. Second, um, learning, uh, including learning communication, is embodied. And I want not only foreign languages, is first and foremost experienced physically, linguistically, emotionally, and artistically. So for some reason we have made, uh, we have, um, or, you know, academia has made us believe that what we're learning, the language learning is, 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 is a cognitive process, it's only a cognitive process. And uh, it's, an, it's, an, it's, a, it's a physical, it's a cognitive experience, but some of the examples that I showed of my son appropriating Spanish and English show that is is not only is is not cognitive. It is physically. It is something physical. It is artistic. It is emotional, and of course, it is linguistic. So, and um, learning and communication are multimodal. So. Um, and then this is why we call, we talk about multimodal pedagogies. I, I will just define uh, later what we mean by multimodal. But for now, if you see the examples that I showed you of the, um, you know, of the uh, productions of, of Nathan, what you see is that he's engaged using different modes of uh, production, different modes of meaning making, different modes of communication. Um, and he is able to put, to express his subjective, um, sub his subjectivity and the engagement with uh, language in different forms. And you saw it in the way he is explaining how he is able to embed a language in the, in the design of a drawing of a fish. And um, the last uh, element is learning is appropriation. And, um, and uh, by appropriation, this is what I mean. So appropriation refers to an individual's internally motivated adoption and adaptation of meanings and cultural practices. And why do we do that? Because we want to develop, to develop our subjectivity. You know, and by subjectivity, I mean, the individual's sense of self, you know, the individual's cognitive and emotional um, um, elements that allow uh, him or her to develop a sense of self. And we don't learn languages to express other self. We learn languages to express ourselves. So, Languages are learned for self-expression. This is why students don't find exciting repeating dialogues. I don't know how many students you've seen very excitedly repeating dialogues because it's not self-expression, right? So uh, appropriation happens when individuals are motivated and when they feel that um, they're going to, that whatever they're doing will help them express their subjective meanings and also express their own meanings for self-expression. And also uh, learning uh, appropriation happens through engagement. Um, and engagement by engagement, I mean this, is the student's subjective dispositions and mindsets um, that is characterized by cognitive, affective, and social interest and willingness to design or redesign meanings. 
So basically, basically learning takes place when there is engagement. You know, when students have this mindset, this disposition, but this disposition has to be cognitive, affective, and social. And to engage with uh, the design or redesign of meanings. So I think um, engagement, learning doesn't happen if, if students are not engaged. Students engage with concepts and students engage with meanings, with artifacts, and that's what helps them produce uh, meaning and meaning leads to, to learning. So here, uh, these are like kind of like my argument and, and my background to all of this. And now I want to introduce like the core concepts of this, you know, like first, uh, you know, I've been talking about multimodal, multimodality. And again, I have uh, many males telling me that they can. Okay. Um, so um, multimodality is a perspective, you know, on communication. And it says that communication is a result of the co-presence and co-dependency of different modes of communication that work together to ensemble meaning. Uh, we have made to believe, uh, we're made to believe that um, communication is linguistic. You know, you learn the grammar, you learn the vocabulary and obviously pronunciation, and then you will be able to make meaning in another language. But what about other modes of communication that take place in communication? Um, here, the London group, for example, proposes these modes of communication. So we communicate visually, we communicate orally, gesturally, spatially, and obviously one of the strongest uh, modes of communication is the linguistic, and the linguistic at the same time divides up into two, um, this speech, and written language. So it is the combination of all of these elements that make uh, all communication multimodal. Communication has always been multimodal. You know, like this is not new. What we're trying to do is to uh, create awareness that communication is multimodal because um, linguistic uh, theory has made us believe that it's only linguistic, that it's only the linguistic mode that allows you to um, carry meaning. So that's one. The second concept is semiotic resources. And this is a very important concept. Um, and uh, for me, it's really easy to define the concept because uh, uh, semiotic resources is anything you use to make meaning, right? It could be uh, an artifact. It could be uh, physical, like gestures, uh, or material, like paper, ink. Um, all of whatever you use to make meaning is a semiotic resource. You know, right now, I'm speaking, so I'm using a uh, different semiotic resource of the linguistic mode, but I'm also using um, um, the screen, right? So you see the screen, you see colors. I'm also using colors. I'm using um, typography, you know, how big the, uh, the font is. And I'm also using punctuation, which is another resource in written language. So um, the next, um, concept is multimodal pedagogies. Um, so multimodal pedagogies uh, proposes only the idea and it's not one, it says pedagogy, so it's, it could be different materializations. And it is not telling you a particular set of um, uh, steps to do anything, it's more like a perspective, you know? And it's just curriculum, pedagogy, and assessment practices um, as, um, uh, that can be centered around the concept of modes. And I already mentioned below, above the, the different modes of communication. So what it proposes is that we plan instruction um, um, based on modes of communication and based on uh, modes of communication to design texts in different learning environments. And this is what I will show you later or actually right now. And so the last concept that I would like to introduce is the concept of transmodality. Okay, I know this concept is gonna sound in the definition you go, you, you have on, on screen sounds a little complicated. So it says movement of ideas across modes and then amplification or mutation of meaning derived 
from the different affordances that different modes bear, right? So uh, this is just to say that um, transmodality happens when you go from one mode of communication to another mode. For example, when you go from the written mode to image mode, you know, if you say um, read this and produce an image that expresses this uh, written text, you're transmodalizing the text. Right? You're going from one mode to another mode, or you can establish chains of a or chains of modes, right? So, all right. So I'm gonna stop for a minute just to check on uh, everyone. So how are how how is everybody uh, doing? Everyone is okay. Yeah. Hi. Thumbs up. Okay. Fine here. Good. good. Now, what I'm going to do, you see, I told you I was going to uh, provide some um, gram some um, concepts, basic, not digging into them too much. And I'm going to show you some examples. Hopefully, we have enough time. I have many examples. And this is where you're going to say, yeah, but I do that. Yes, that's right. Remember my caveat at the beginning of this, uh, of this talk? Uh, many, of, many of you might not have been at the beginning, but I said, you are going to say this when I show you the examples. Um, so most of the examples that I'm going to show you are taken from a uh, university classes that I've taught. And then this is another caveat because you're going to say, yeah, but I teach at a school. Right. But remember what I'm doing here is sharing what I do, right? You feel free to use it as you uh, are able to do it based on your, your conditions. So uh, most, uh, most of them were students in, in the undergrad program, but I also use some of these things in the grad programs in in graduate school um, and then my perspective was always multimodal pedagogies and the teaching approach was I drew on different ones like project based task based and so on. so let's show you a couple of examples some of you who have been in previous talks may have uh, seen some of these tasks so um, this is a class that I taught a couple of years ago um, and I and I've done like two iterations of the same class and I varied some of the tasks so I'm gonna show you just examples, all right? So um, here's one example of a listening activity. So uh, I hope you can see my screen. Uh, all right, so I want you to kind of like go over the instructions because it's important that you know like how the tasks are designed. Um, hopefully you can see, can you? Yes, we can. Right, great. Yes. So, um, so what you're gonna see here is uh, first a movement of modes of communication. You know, like I asked my students, choose one song of your favorite artists, make sure that the song has a video clip. And then what I want you to do is to focus on the connections between the video clip and the lyrics. And then uh, I want them to um, make a written post. So you see how uh, we went from um, audio visual Right, and then we I ask them to go to another mode, which is the written mode. That's transmodalization, right? Um, and with all of the uh, with all of the processes that this implies, you know. Um, and notice that I wanted to foreground the listening activity, right? The listening skill, but I also connected it to the written part, not leaving aside um, their own identities. And you know, their own identities is telling them choose the best, the song you like, you know? And that's what allows them to bring in themselves into uh, the English class. And then I give the instructions of what they are supposed to do, right? Um, and I, if I also wanna work a little bit on, on, on grammar on, 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 or on, on language, I ask them to, you know, focus on expressions or uh, words that you think you learn out of this assignment, right? And then you make the post with uh, publishing all of these things. And then I ask a, five, uh, a fifth question about aspects of culture, because in multimodal pedagogies, the cultural aspect is also inserted. So, and then I give the, you know, all of these very formal instructions that you have to take into account when you do online assignments, you know, telling them when, where, and how you're going to grade. And then you have uh, then students posts, you know, Students saying, look, this is my song. Uh, this is how I interpret it. 
these are the things that I like the most. These are expressions or words that I learned. And you know, this is very good because you can actually see students' language levels, you know, by looking at the words they choose, like, oh, this word was new. And then you can tell how much English they may know, right? By just by looking at what is it that they think is new in a song, in the lyrics of a song. And then they start uh, several discussions, like here, I think this video matches perfectly. And you see, this is, you will see, of course, students' grammar mistakes. This is a third semester class, right? And then you have the uh, responses by other students, like agree with you. Um, so notice this, um, when you ask, is the when you tell a student this instruction, you post, you watch the video, you do the exercise that I'm asking you to do, and then you post it. But you, then you have to reply to two more classmates. That means that they have to go and watch two more videos and to do think of the analysis twice. In other words, you're exposing them to three exercises of listening, their own work and two more. And plus they have to write the reactions, right? Plus they will also read what language was new for the other classmates. Or you see how much exposure to language and to communication they have here? So this is just one exercise. And uh, this is one listening assignment. I'm gonna show you another one. Hopefully I'm not going too fast, but I have a lot of stuff to show you. And anyways, if I can't, I will always, I will always be happy to, to uh, share with you uh, this material, right? Uh, this is a very traditional uh, exercise, uh, but it's good because um, it, 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 it allows students to engage with language in different ways. And is, this is a typical traditional uh, exercise of, hey guys, uh, listen to this, and I want you to transcribe it. Transcribe the first minute. And then uh, the, the rest, you give him uh, questions. Well, that's what I did. I created a Google form and then I gave him questions. And then uh, at the, what they had to do was to do the transcription. And you say like, what is this? This is again, transmodality. They have a listening and they have to transmodalize it and to put it in written. But what matters to me is how they engage with language and sounds. What I want you to, you know, like the idea of you, of getting students to interact with language at the, at the subjective level is very important. You know, you, you, if you saw my son, how he was interacting with the idea of pace, and he, he was, how he was, uh, you drawing it by inserting the words and the letters in the drawing itself, that's a very way, nice way of uh, subjectively interacting with language. And when you have students, transcribe, they have to think of many things when they transcribe. That's one way of, uh, in, uh, of putting them in that situation, even if, we don't, if they don't do it right. So um, this is another one, uh, which is very simple, but I think is worth it. Uh, I'm gonna show you the third example. Um, this is, um, this is um, oh, this one, I loved it. This is an exercise that I loved. Um, so, um, and you're saying that, yeah, but how do you match this with your, with your syllabus? You know, like you have a syllabus, you have the grammar you have to teach. Yeah, everything I did was aligned with the grammar I was teaching because we can't escape institutional constraints. You know, like you have to do the grammar um, and functions. So for example, this is the time when they were supposed to be learning um, models, right, models. And so uh, I said, you know, guys, this is what I would like you to do. And I invented this idea of what it is required, what is required to, right? So I told him, I want you to tell me, um, if you play a guitar, I want you to tell me what is required for someone to learn to play the guitar or to play the guitar, right? Or anything you may want. So, and I gave him a prompt here, like to play a guitar, you must practice at least two week, two, twice a week, you may, need to hire a tutor or enroll in lessons and so on. So I wanted to kind of like set the context for the use of um, models, right? And then I, you don't imagine, uh, okay, so and this is the instruction. What they were supposed to do was to go for from that personal knowledge, which is embodied, right? To verbal, the, the transmodalization was like embodied towards verbal production. And I asked them to do that description on Bokaru. Bokaru 
is a, is a small platform that allows you to record. I don't know if you know it. Is this is the this is the thing you record and then you can share your recording online, or you can embed it. You can do many things with it, right? So it's pretty simple, but it's pretty useful. So I wanted them to record their their um, their what what is required to, and oh, you know, like they had oh many many interesting things. Some people, someone I remember this person who she said something like how to she gives a description. And at the end, what she's, the description she's saying is how to put on your glasses properly. Uh, and another student was teaching how to do um, beatbox, you know, how he was trying to express how do you do beatbox, you know, and many things, you know, it was very creative. And what was really interesting is that how they put up uh, some of the things they do, and it, it is allowing them to show what they do, you know and that their own identities coming out and showing it and sharing them. And this creates a lot of alliances between them as a community. Um, and then they had the comments, you know, again, two people commenting on what the, the recordings that they made. Um, so this is another one that I did. Um, right. Again, they were to react to two. Uh, this is the listening assignment number four. Um, Okay, this is, uh, this is uh, um, based on uh, watching uh, at the time in Colombia, we were doing uh, all of this of um, the peace process, uh, peace negotiation. And of course, there was a lot of debate about whether it was good or bad. So I, I, I wanted to have a debate in class. And for a as a preparation for that debate, I asked them to watch some videos and then uh, they, they held some uh, uh, discussions here uh, showing the pros and cons. Uh, but in here, what I wanted them to do was to tell me, most like retell me what they saw as the cons and pros in the videos because I presented different videos with different perspectives and also articles. And um, they engaged in discussions of showing, you know, like this is the what I saw, this is what I understood and so on. And later in the semester, what I did was that they had a letter exchange. Uh, they were writing letters uh, between courses. You know, I had a course and there was a, this other teacher with another course of third semester. And we decided to do an exchange of letters. One, explain, sending a message expressing, you know, this is what I think of the peace process in Colombia. And they started this exchange. Yes, and of course, all of this was preparation for that. So we went from uh, audiovisual then they wrote, we had a debating class, and then they ended up writing a letter, right? And then you're saying, uh, where is uh, like the context of all of this? Uh, we were teaching how to write letters, right? And so all of this uh, is involved in a context uh, that allows them to think critically about different things and to, of course, use language meaningfully. All right, so um, those are some exercises. I'm gonna show you uh, tasks that I also conducted more like, uh, not like fleshed out tasks. Um, all right, so how many people have I lost? I'm sorry, I am going fast and I know that I sound excited, but- No, the number has increased, no worries. All right, um, so, so in this one, I, we did something that uh, I haven't shown before, you know, because in the previous ones, we were more focused on uh, listening, right? This one, we went through exploration of some other skills. For example, in this one, I asked them to read a story. Yes, um, they read a story. And uh, then I asked them some questions, right? And out of those questions, they were uh, to create a video. But it's, it was a video and uh, a video uh, of five minutes answering the questions. Some of those questions were, uh, um, analytical. Um, so the story was called Under the Western Eyes and uh, it was a, a story that talked about communism, socialism, capitalism, all of these um, systems. And so they had to uh, you know, discuss that within the story and then they had to create this video. Um, and again, same thing, Re uh, read, we discuss in class, then they create the video and they post it and then two people have to react. And uh, here they have uh, the video created. 
and uh, they post it and then you will have the discussions of students saying, yeah, I understand what you're saying or I don't agree with you. I think you misunderstood this and that and they start in this dialogue to discuss the meanings of the story, which was not really that straightforward. Um, so look at this, for example, this student says, hey Cesar, I, I really liked your video. I think it was easier for me to understand the main topic. You see, is, is, is also that it helps students enhance their understanding by reading the others. Not only they uh, are able to say, this is what I think, this is what I understood, but they also look at the other ones and they say, oh yeah, thank you, I didn't get that part. So this is one, and if you wanna ever try this mail boo, it's, you know, you could try and see how uh, it, it will work for you to have students do uh, video tasks. This is another task. Um, about, okay, so in this one, we were talking about descriptions. We were, you know, like the grammar and the functions were about descriptions. And so we want, I, I said, um, uh, I also forgot to tell you something at the beginning that in the class, like we had a big project about uh, travel, right? Like the, the theme of the semester was travel, right? So a lot of the things we did was about traveling and traveling in the, you know, in the, in the, in the direct sense of you going somewhere, but also uh, in a subjective kind of uh, trip. Um, so, and what I asked them to do was to create like a blog. Have you seen that these travel blogs? You know, some people have blogs that are dedicated to tell others or other travelers how, how they, you know, what to do when they travel, when they go to a certain uh, place, what to do, how to go around it, and so on. So I said, uh, I want you to explore some of those um, blogs, and then I want you to create your own blog, you know, of a visit, you know, of a place you have been to. You know, remember, I always depart from their own experience, whatever they've done. I want them to be, you know, first because it's easy for you to talk about things you know uh, firsthand. So, and then, as usual, I I give them uh, instructions very carefully of how to do it, and I guide them through uh, the creation of the blocks and all of that. And then um, I'm gonna show you a couple of examples. I'm gonna show you, for example, this one. This is one one student created. Uh, this student created this one, and this is a trip she, 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 she made to uh, Cartagena de Indias. And this is the blog she designed. You know, it's a, it's a combination of image, and um, you see, in terms of multimodal, she uses uh, images, she uses text, but she also uses um, special distribution. You know, this also, look, I think this is pretty neat the way it looks, right? In the recommendations as a travel blog. Right, and then uh, there's all of these discussions, you know, uh, I believe, I enjoy, thank you very much, all of their classmates. Um, and um, uh, I'm just gonna allow you to read. And she also replies, Brenda said something and then she replied to her comment. And Brenda went back to reply. You see, it's uh, ideally is that they can engage in dialogue, not like one person posts and then the other person does not reply. Ideal is that they can go on engaged in the discussions and so on. So this is uh, uh, um, this activity was pretty interesting, and uh, students um, worked on their um, on on their blogs and. Um, All right, so I wanted to also um, point out something that I asked them to do. In this case, uh, I asked them to work on language from a different perspective. I told them, look, if you happen to catch grammar mistakes or spelling mistakes in the blogs you read, I want you to be kind and tell the person that there are certain mistakes. And here you see on the screen, you say, hi, Leslie, uh, for the corrections in your post, I only found these mistakes. In the sixth paragraph, second line, when you write, we arrived to Cartagena, I think is we arrived in Cartagena. Yes, so you can also do that. I mean, depending on the students, you can also say, okay, so if you find something that you think is not well said, you can do that, right? 
and I am, uh, and this is me, this is my post, you know, like also letting her know that I participated and I read her uh, blog. Right, I'm gonna go back to um, another one, um, another uh, project task. So um, this is a task of identity. Um, for this one, I wanted the, I wanted them to uh, design a collage, a photo collage, uh, speaking about their identity as language learners. Yes, and you see the description here. Um, and again, I asked them to create a mailbox video. And this one was a little bit more complex because I wanted them to create a collage. And then after that, I wanted them to create a video explaining the collage. And then I wanted them to react to two people, uh, 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 to two people's collages. So, and I gave him feedback. I gave him the, um, the, the websites where they could create the collage and um, all the instructions. And uh, uh, just one example that I wanna show you here, um, this one, I think this was a cool one. Uh, this is the collage one student created. It's interesting because he didn't want to do it with a digital uh, resource. He said, I'm gonna do it manually and he drew the collage. And you see, um, uh, this is how he sees himself, his identity as a language learner. Uh, and he said, yeah, but uh, I would like explanation. So what he did is ha that he designed a video to explain. Here comes the video explaining it. So he explains his collage and then he has the interactions and the re reactions by, by, by the classmates, yes? And also myself. So that's, that's one example of, of the collage. So one more thing that we did, and if you think of, of, of this, it's they went from creating an image. In this case, they went from creating an image to creating a video. And from the video, which is spoken language, they went to written language, you know, to interact writtenly with their classmates. Um, and then uh, to make it more interesting, uh, in the summer festival of the university, uh, most of those students uh, presented their collage uh, productions. So they gave him another opportunity to embody uh, their collage by explaining uh, them in front of an audience. So I wanna show you uh, number four, task number four. This is a comic strip. This is an activity that I'm very uh, dear uh, because, um, and I always show this one because I like it. Um, you know, I ask students to read this story, right? And um, and then I said, okay, so instead of instead of giving them a quiz, you know how we usually give them the typical quiz of what are the main characters, um, who did this, who did that? I said, well, if they read the story, they can, instead of asking them that, I can ask them to be more productive and go beyond that and to design a comic of the story. But I say, I'm gonna insert a twist. And the twist was this one. I said, um, I hear. So I said, your task is to modify the story by introducing yourself as a re relevant character in it. You will enter the story as a Colombian character within the context proposed by the writer of the story. You are not allowed to take it off any of the already existing characters. You can though change even any event in this story. So what I wanted it to do was to insert themselves as Colombians in an Australian context, which is this, the context of the story. And to see what happened when they introduced themselves in the story without changing too much the story and the main events. And I asked them to answer the question, how they would distinguish or resemble culturally the other characters in the story. And this is a question for culture, right? To engage the intercultural perspective. And I had different uh, answer, di different examples. Uh, I like this one. This is one created by one student. Um, I, we don't have time to go over it, but I'm going to, uh, Whole, uh, to let you see a little bit this one. She says, my character is different from the other characters in the story. 
because she lives in a country where different ethnic groups coexist and are very mixed in their daily life. And she's talking about herself, right? So we have some territories that are particular for some communities, but there are three ethnic groups, Black, Indigenous, and Mestizos. Um, we also have discrimination and racism like in Australia, but the cultural barriers are a bit more blurry here. That's why my character says that she figured out that they were friendly and spiritual, so on, so on. So she starts a, a, an interesting discussion and reflection about interculturality in Colombia. So I'm gonna kind of like go back to you guys. Are you okay, that guys? Right? Yep, we're all yes. awake. Okay. Yep. What is yes. Was to... It's okay, it's clear. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So uh, I wanted to. Um, no, I think I'm gonna have to skip this one. And what I can do is to share all of this with you because we don't have time. Um, I have more tasks here, but there's, this is another one. And uh, especially this one is about embodiment, you know? And in this one, I went with uh, my students to a museum, the local museum. And um, what I wanted them to do was to engage with any of the cultural artifacts they found and then to do an exploration of that. So some of those show the, shows this, this is a performance, and this is another performance. And they had, we went to the museum, they had a, a format they had to complete and it was mostly about describing how art works, like uh, elements of multimodal understanding of painting or a sculpture. And then uh, they, they were supposed, uh, out of that embodied experience, they were supposed to choose one of these uh, art artifacts and start prepare a PowerPoint of five slides and talk about the author, the type of art and the interpretation they give to that kind of art. And again, we go from, you know, embodiment art and then they go to a pictorial uh, depiction, which is the PowerPoint and they speak spoken. So there is a, a, a chain of transmodality in which they use language in different ways and they engage in learning about uh, art. Now, I want to go back to my PowerPoint. I uh, Look, I'm sorry, I have so many other things to show you here. I just want to show you the last one. Um, this one, I loved it. Um, um, have you guys seen this, uh, this, power, this website? It's called Class Tools Net. And it allows you to build games uh, for your classes. Very simple or very difficult games. I want to show you a sample of a game here. Look at this game. So. Um, so uh, the idea is called um, a connect the force. So it, you say here, Paul, and then you see here, John, and then you see here, Ringo, and then you see here, who else? Am I missing? Who am I missing? George. George. Right? George. right. Beatles, right? Then we have blue, white, red, and we have green, right? Mm -hmm. And then we have Ireland, England, uh, Scotland, and Wales. Right. So what you see here is uh, reveal the connection. The connection here, what is? Beatles, colors, countries. So this, you can do it for your English classes. But if you're teaching content classes, imagine you're teaching content classes, you can do this in content classes. I had my students read, um, here is the assignment for this. And I asked my students to read, uh, we were, this is for a class uh, uh, in which we were reading um, something about um, uh, applied linguistics. And they were supposed to do this reading and then they were supposed to create the game. Obviously it's more difficult because it's about concepts, but they were able to do it and they really enjoyed it. There are some other things you can do. You can have students develop um, um, uh, mind maps, which is another transmodalization, which is very important if you want students to show different conceptualizations, you know, going from reading from written text and reading and have them show that through an image that is uh, a mind map. So that creates different connections in uh, that allow for learning to happen. You can also have uh, Novio. Uh, Novio is a very interesting uh, tool because students can do, um, students can do, uh, at the same time, they can they can create. Okay, I'm gonna show you this one. Uh, 
This one uh, allows you to create a PowerPoint and at the same time, um, at the same time, um, uh, I'm not sure if this is coming. Oh, yes. So for this assignment, the student was uh, it, it was instructed to Buenas uh, noches. Build, uh, to a continuación, create, comentaré uh, algunas consideraciones sobre el texto de Mateus con relación uh, a mi contexto or, or the educativo so y laboral. En primer lugar, he resaltado online. este aspecto. And then, el avance usual, de... Reading of or interpretations of the readings, and again, the interaction between students uh, happens, and uh, this uh, this is with a master's class. All right, so I don't have more time to show you the more examples, but I have more. Uh, so I'm gonna go to um, some considerations or recommendations. Number one, uh, if you want to engage students in multimodal pedagogies, um, first you have to help students recognize that communication goes beyond the linguistic aspects. You know, you have to tell, to learn them, help them understand that are mo there are modes and there are semiotic resources. You can use material like this. Look, uh, here uh, you can tell students little by little that uh, you communicate in linguistic, in the linguistic mode because of the words you use, because of the sentences, the paragraph organization and so on. You can also teach them how they can look at visual stuff by looking at the color, the style, the size, the perspective. Uh, they, you can teach them that gestures communicate by the facial expressions, hand gestures, body language, spatial, how people organize their bodies in space, that communicates, and audio, how sound effects um, and um, emphasis and so on on, uh, on sounds uh, communicate. So you can little by little start making students understand that communication is multimodal. The second one is to familiarize students with characteristics of text textual genres. I mean, it's very important that before you throw them out to build um, any a poster or an infographic or a documentary, you 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 familiarize them with the genres. You know, help them get. Uh, to understand what are some of the characteristics. So they have examples. And so whenever you say, all right, go do it, they know, oh, so you know, this is what usually uh, is included in a documentary or a mind map and so on. The third one is allow students to explore their creativity. Look at this. Um, in one of the classes that I had, I asked, you, you know, like when we have students and we tell them like first thing in class, introduce yourselves. And what, what I told my students is introduce yourselves, but use a multimodal text, you know, what would you do to introduce yourself? So one student created this, she created um, a crossword. And by doing this crossword, she would present herself. This is very interesting. Another student did this, she created a rima, right? And so she said, uh, this is how she says it, por una equivocación del doctor, mis papás creyeron que nacería siendo un señor. Destinada a ser llamada Leonardo, llegué a este mundo y cambié el rumbo de ese dardo. Nombrada Camila Blanca Crespo y Mona, crecí en un hogar sin llevar puesta una corona. Mamá, sin papá a su lado, tuvo que guerrear el doble de su trabajo con dos niñas bajo su brazo. Nos forjó en valores y nos alejó del fracaso. You see, this is very nice, you know, that's how she introduced herself. And this is a student who likes gaming. I didn't know he liked gaming until he came up with this. And this is how he introduced himself. I, I would have never known, you know, that he likes gaming and he does this if I hadn't asked, you know, present, introduce yourself in the way you think more comfortable to do it. Um, so this is another, uh, this is a 3D um, 
uh, designed by a student, I asked him, how would you conceptualize pedagogy? Uh, and uh, after some materials we have this, we had discussed in red, and so many people created different multimodal uh, products, and she created a 3D design to express how she defines multimodality. multimodality. And you see how she's considering the teacher, and how she's introducing uh, diversity in the classroom. Right. Um, the other characteristic is uh, think of what modes of communication and transmodal sequences would benefit your instructional goals. So if you want to focus on the communicative aspect, the linguistic, uh, the content-based aspect, you plan accordingly, you know, uh, see what modes of communication you think you will have to stream, uh, to, um, to put together, to string together, and you say like, yeah, this will allow me to work more on this aspect of communication or language or content, if you're teaching content. So thinking of the modes. Um, Multimodal tasks do not always require technology. You know, some of you are saying like, if, what if I don't want to use the uh, computers? Uh, you can do this in class without technology. You can create games, posters, role plays, brochures, dance, singing, or handicraft without using technology. But then you have to think, see how uh, the modes will work. Finally, if you plan digital multimodal tasks, First, I think you could see some of these things in my examples. First, make sure to provide detailed instructions. What is the objective? Tell students what your obje objective is. Provide step-by-step -step guidelines. Tell them the how, the when, and where. Link the, um, the, the, the technological resource. No, don't tell them do this, but you say do it and use this um, software. But if you wanna use another software, feel free, but you provide the software so they can do uh, especially if free software. Um, and always include the grading criteria, right? Try the digital applications yourselves first, you know? <laughs> Don't ask students to do something you haven't troubleshoot, uh, shoot it yourself. You, uh, troubleshoot yourself the, 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 um, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the application and then you um, ask students and when they come up with the same problems, you help them trouble, troubleshoot. Be available to provide support. You will get a, a, emails, I can't do it, this is, and then you will have to be able to try to help them out. And help build a community and participate in it. Since most of these assignments imply that students will introduce their lives to the other classmates, that helps create community. You don't imagine how at the end they know each other and they appreciate every other person because they know what this person likes, where this person has traveled, and it's important that you participate, you know, always you, in the, if, you, if, if it is a blog, you participate, that they show like, oh, the teacher is part of this. He's not just asking us to provide the assignment and then, and then grading. He's also giving an opinion. He's also expressing that he likes what we do. He's also surprised that we do this or that. And also use or design rubrics to assess multimodal tests. This is usually hard, but I'm, I'm showing you, I'm gonna show you examples here. This is one rubric. You can have rubrics by uh, modes and questions, like if the production of the students uh, meet these requirements, the visual, the gestural design, the auditory design, the spatial design. And um, this is another rubric, and this could be another rubric. My opinion or my recommendation is agree on the rubrics with your students. Take like a set of criteria and tell them, okay, guys, let's, if you're going to design a poster, what do you think you, we should uh, look at a poster? Okay, so the quality of the colors, the image and so on. So you start creating a, a, a rubric with them so they know what they're going to be graded on what basis. Now, finally, uh, I know I went a little bit uh, beyond the allowed time. I'm sorry about that. Um, so multimodal pedagogies allow students to, all right, number one, discover other semiotic resources and expand their view of communication and meaning making. They, it also allows uh, people to communicate critically, you know, uh, to enhance critical thinking if you think of the things that I did in my class, to collaborate, to design messages creatively, creatively and appropriate, an appropriate language through engagement in genuine tasks. The feedback my students usually give me is, look, uh, the tasks that we did in class allowed us to use language genuinely, you know, like it's not repetition, it's, we use language for creative and genuine, genuine purposes. 
uh, and that allows them to uh, engage more in the learning process and appropriate language. It enhances intercultural skills. It also improves computing and ICT skills, not only on the part of students, but also on the part of teachers. And um, what's very important for me is that students can perform their identities and express their subjective, subjective worlds, which in many cases, we don't really get to know students' subjective worlds. But many of these um, uh, multimodal uh, tasks allow students to show who they are and not only uh, let their classmates see them as their real selves, but also the teacher. And that's very meaningful. All right, so closing. Thank you very much. Uh, this is an invitation to join the SIG. I coordinate. Uh, uh, this is the, 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 the link to the blog. You can subscribe there. And also, I also want to invite you to submit your proposals to present at the ASO Copy National Conference in October. We're still receiving proposals. Uh, the conference is going to be online. Uh, so feel free uh, to ask us and to send your proposals. Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Um, we have um, a lot of people still connected. And um, they are asking the ones, the latecomers are asking, of course, if we're going to upload this presentation. The answer is yes. And we're going to try to convince Jose to do it again. And maybe uh, like a, a follow up or something like that. He doesn't know that yet. <laughs> and that's about it. So once again, thank you very much, Jose, for your uh, very useful and fruitful presentation. Now, um, I just I was paying attention to the questions and something really interesting that happened in the chat was that some um, were asking questions and uh, among themselves, they were helping each other to answer those questions. So that was super interesting. And uh, one of the questions uh, they, um, they have is, um, what's the approach for assessing these assignments? How would you like... Uh, what would you, you already said it? Uh, you would have to negotiate with the students the type of rubrics you're going to evaluate them with, uh, but also what other um, approaches would you recommend for assessing students uh, in these type of um, assignments? Yeah, that's always a very tricky question because, uh, as you know, multimodal pedagogy is very recent, you know, it's just developing. Um, and uh, what we're telling uh, students is look, when you communicate, there's different elements of communication that intervene and that will make your communication successful or, or not, right? And so you have to start identifying those elements that complete the, 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 the spiral of communication. So uh, I guess initially with oh. students, uh, it, it has to be a process where you help the students understand that there are different modes and semiotic resources and then start inserting those resources. And as far as uh, the production of those uh, multimodal projects, uh, and what I say, you know, you have to say, okay, guys, now I know uh, if you're going to create an infographic, you know, you're going to use these modes. You're going to uh, create it on the basis of what, how you distribute space, what images you're going to choose and how those images match the content is not decoration. And also the written language, how you're going to use the language there, you know, the grammar and all of these elements. And then are you gonna use colors? Of course. So you have to say, if those are the elements, how would you uh, uh, conceive, what would you say are the criteria for a successful infographic? And then you see, you have to see with them because you have the language. Important thing is to have the language. Like, okay, there has to be coherence between the images and what you write, right? Uh, the color has to be coherent also with the tone, the mood of the infographic. Is it serious? It's going to be a happy uh, infographic. And then with the students, you have to basically sit down and construct uh, those multimodal um, rubrics. And that's the way we would be assessing, uh, assessing that. So, but they have to be aware that uh, all of those elements uh, are considered and what of those elements should be uh, evaluated or assessed. Um, well, uh, they were just like asking some very specific questions in regards to like the benefits, like the, the pros and cons in regards to using certain, um, um, uh, let's call it uh, tools, instruments or applications. But I guess, as you said, we will have to um, tinker around to play around with them before we actually could uh, uh, evaluate them. 
Absolutely. And, you know, the, the internet is very changing. Some of these applications, they are today, but then tomorrow they are just disappears. They just disappear. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a matter of trying and uh, getting to a point where you know how to use them and where you know how to tr troubleshoot them and uh, using them in different ways. You know, a very simple things you can use in the, uh, to apply the concept of, of transmodalization. All right. Uh, one of the, the key questions always we are asked is um, what type of um, suggestions, how would you deal, what type of activities would you um, recommend to use with uh, true beginners? Yeah, well, in most cases, many of these things can be done, you know, um, what the, the, what, and this is the part, the idea of helping understand um, a, a, that communication is not only verbal, you know, look, in many cases, um, uh, the first day of class, what we do is to tell our students is like, uh, in basic classes, you know, you say, you say to them like, hey guys, I want you to introduce yourself. And then you, you usually have a little dialogue and then you throw them in front. That's just scary as hell, you know, like it's just the first day and suddenly you're in front of 30 people you don't know like, speaking in English, right? So when I say like, why don't you use a multimodal type of activity? And then you tell them, look guys, what I want you to do for next class is to design a little poster of yourselves. And that's gonna be their backup. In that little poster, they can write little information that they will be very scared and they, they might not even remember when they go in front, in front to present. Or even instead of doing that, you say like, guys, I want you to create a video in which you introduce yourselves, right? And they have the possibility of, okay, they sit in front of the computer or the cell phone and they practice and they possibly read. But then uh, by doing this, you are allowing them time to plan and to take it in a different way. So they are using other semiotic resources to comply with the, with the purpose, with the, with the communicative purpose. Because you say, what I want you to do is to introduce yourselves. And it doesn't have to be verbal. It, they could use other semiotic resources to help the verbal message. So what I'm telling people is that don't always think that they have to produce verbally. Given the opportunity to use other resources to express the meanings they want. And maybe that's going to ease a little bit the heavy weight students carry all the time of producing verbal language and basically legitimizing that they are learning the language. No, they are learning communication. And communication allows for many sources, many semiotic resources. And uh, I'm pretty sure if you try this, you will see that students will feel like, okay, I know that whatever you're asking me to do, uh, there's different ways I can do it. One of them is linguistic and I'm working on it, but allow me to use other resources to help complete the communicative process you're asking me for. All right. Um, well, I guess we have like one or two more questions. Uh, I, nobody wants to leave either, so we're good, <laughs> okay? So uh, one question is like, is interaction in forums assessed? How would you do it? Yes. Um, look, one of the things that we also have to get away of is the idea that we have to control everything that goes, that goes on in the classroom. Yeah, we have to forget about that idea, right? Because the classroom should also be a free space for certain things. And um, in many of the, of the, um, of the, of the blogs, in, the, in those blog posts, I said, I will focus on grammar. In some other cases, like we, we will all focus on grammar. You know, I told them like today, you guys are going to revise grammar or the classmates and I will also do so. And we will be more, uh, co it will be more co-constructive. Co but really in many of those cases, what I want them to get off out was the message. And what I went, what I did was to go over the the the, um, the posts and then I would say this is a common mistake this is a common mistake this is a common mistake and without pointing fingers I would go in front of the class and say guys by reading your last posts I noticed that these are the most common mistakes and I will work on that and um, in some other cases uh, I know many of you are saying like 
gee, this is a lot of work. How do I go over all of those posts? You don't have to do that. In many cases, what you tell your students is this. You say, guys, I am going to read all of your posts because of course I want to know what you're going to say because it's interesting, you know? An activity that's interesting in language teaching is the activity in which you, the teacher, don't have the answer. It's boring when you have to review stuff where you have the answer. But when you go to, with the expectation of, okay, let's see what surprise comes out of this. And students surprise you. You will say, students surprise you because you don't know this, their worlds. When they open up their worlds, it's like, wow, incredible. So uh, you don't have to go over every single one. What you tell them is like, in this assignment, I'm only going to focus on five people at random. And those people, you focus very much on giving them feedback and grammar on all of that. And then the next time around, you choose other five people, but you don't have to do everyone in every single assignment. Maybe somehow related to the same question, um, would you recommend to use, um, or would you suggest to use formative assessment? Yes, uh, I think all of the time, uh, what you're doing is formative assessment. All right. Because the work, you know, uh, whatever uh, you write in the post, and it, it's like the it, even the is formative and is coevaluative because when your friends write, hey, I got your point, but you know this part, I think you were not clear, or I think you didn't get the point in the reading. What more feedback can it be? You know, it's a classmate telling him in a more friendly way, without the asymmetry that the teacher implies. Like I didn't get what you said. You know, one more feedback can it be? The person said like, okay, I'm gonna go back to check or I'm gonna read some other posts to see what is it that I didn't get. All right. So that's, that's pretty much what we have so far. Um, well, I guess this is it. We um, only over exceeded uh, 15 more minutes. <laughs> it's all right. So uh, once again, thank you very much to you all for having attended this conference, this webinar. And of course, once again, thank you, Jose, for everything that you have done for us, for the association. Um, hopefully, we're going to be around. Our next session is going to be next Wednesday. Um, so we're going to, once again, advertise it. We're going to send the links uh, to, your, to your emails. Uh, so please make sure that you do connect right before uh, five in the afternoon next Wednesday. Jose? Uh, Jair, can I ask for something? Sure. Can I ask people to turn on their cameras? Because I know there are many old friends that I had not said hello for a long time. And I want to see some of you and say hello. Aurora, hello. Angela, hello. OK, while well, you turn your cameras, I would like to say thank you also to the attendees on YouTube and have posted the, the questions they asked and the comments. So they are thanking you also, Jose Lemar, for the information they received. And they are expecting having the, the links that you were mentioning, the applications or the web pages that you were mentioning also, in order to uh, start working with this. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jairo, for your work on uh, YouTube. And I'm looking at many people here. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry. I cannot say hello to every one of you, friends of mine, all friends that I had not uh, heard from a long time. But yeah, it's, it's, very, happy, it's very cool to, to uh, know that you guys join us today. So don't forget, next week we have another webinar. It's going to be Wednesday at 5. So please, please, please uh, save that space, save that spot there in your agendas, all right? Uh, we are already have uh, the agenda for the webinars of June and also for July. So please stay tuned and uh, we're going to see you next Wednesday again. Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon. Please stay safe. Thank um, you, something, Thank you. Some, oh, something else. Yeah, yeah. Um, please, would you check the database so everybody just can get the, the link previously because I, I've, I read some things, some comments yeah. on the chat about the 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 link, the link. I, I got it yeah. i got it but some people didn't so yep it would be interesting for them to, to yeah have it. we emailed today only today we emailed two thousand emails so okay, good, thanks. <laughs> i don't know where those mails went to all righty thank you very much yes. uh, good to see you all please stay safe i will see you guys next wednesday have a great afternoon
Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, bye. Sí, creo que ya. Y es que hay mucha gente. Más de 100 personas. Bye, Dianita. Aurora, chao. Hola, profe. ¿Quién me está saludando? Mala, mala, mala. Bye. Así es, gracias por joinarnos, man. Hola, Hola José. José. Hola, ¿quién me está hablando? Hola. Rubiela, hola. No, soy Marixa, ¿no? Hola. Marixa. Mari, apareces como Rubiela Fantino. Hola, Maritza. <risa> hola. Ay, no sé. ¿Cómo va? Ah, es que me tocó prestar computador. Eh. Ah, ok. Es que no te veo. Te veo oscuro. ¿Cómo va? Hola, Jairito. Hola, Mari. ¿Cómo estás? ¿Cómo ¿Tiempo estás? sin verte? ¿Cierto? Qué alegría verte. ¿Cómo está tu muñeca? Grandísima. O sea, Jairo, ya se acabó la conexión en, 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 YouTube, en YouTube, no va a ser que nos estén no. para la chismografía. Nos toca hacer un zoom solo para el chisme, ¿ok? Ay, ay, ay. Mari, ¿cómo vas? Cuéntame. Bien, ¿y tú? Imagínate que me equivoqué, pensé que era más tarde y me llegó visita, me equivoqué y yo, oh no, empecé tardísimo, 5 para las 5, para las 6. Ah, güey, bueno, madre. Bueno, por ahí después vamos a publicar en, en, en la grabación por si quieres verla desde el principio. Ok, listo. ¿Cómo van? ¿Cómo estás? Uf, bien, aquí en la casita. Eh, ¿no? José, no sé cómo parar la transmisión. Entiendo. Espera, yo le digo a, a Fernando Naranjo que. Sí, la porque él es el que puede, sí. A ver. A ver, gracias, Fernando. Ay, niño, ¿y dónde estás tú? ¿De Maritza? ¿Te acuerdas de Maritza? Ah, ya fuimos sí. al baby shower. Saludos. Por... Hola. ¿Cómo está de grande? Hola, ¿cómo estás? Bien, bien. Bien, grande. Ay, ¿Esa es tu hija, Jairo? Jairo, ¿esa es tu hija? Sí. sí no, wow, ya parece. Hola. Wow. Gigante. Sí. ¿Cierto? ¿Cuántos años tiene ya? 